Hello and welcome to another episode of Dad vs. Daughter. I'm Tim the Dad, and in this Dad-only edition, I'm going to be talking about the base game for Cold Express. Now, I've already talked about the Big Box Edition, which you can see right there, on the channel, so you can check that video out if you want to see what everything is in that Big Box. But in this video, I'm just going to be covering the base game and how it's played. Then I'm going to give you my overall thoughts. So let's get this to the table because we got a train to catch. Each player is going to pick a character that they want to play, and they're going to get this uh, character sheet. They're going to get a character card. They're going to get 10 action cards and six bullet cards, all in their color, as well as their little uh, bandit token. Now, I want to point out that the rule book really does not talk about these character uh, mats at all, with the exception of... In the rule book, it says this right here. Six bonus character profiles included to be used instead of the character cards. Because basically what happens is the uh, rules are going to talk about the character card that looks like this. So it's going to have the, the player character on there. It's going to show what their special ability is. And on the back side, you're going to see these pistols with uh, $1,000 there. I'm going to talk about what that means in a minute, but the rules are only talking about this. And essentially, these mats here take the place of that card. Each player is also going to start with one of the money purses that is worth $250. Now, whenever they have uh, the money purses or the uh, jewels or one of the strong boxes, on their player board, then those are gonna be face down and the player can look at those at any time, but it's kept secret from all the other players what the true value is. To set up the train, you are always going to have the locomotive. So you would place that in the front part. And then based on the number of players, that determines how many of the actual train cars you're going to use. So in this case, we have enough for six players. So if we had a six player game, we would be using all of those. But let's say that we were only playing with four players. We would just use four of those, and the other two would stay in the box. Now, it doesn't really matter what order that you put these in. However, I do want to point out that uh, you are going to be putting loot inside each one of these. And it shows you right here how much of each of the loot items you're going to put in. So in this car, I'm going to be putting in four money bags or purses and one ruby. This one, I'm going to be putting uh, one money purse and one ruby. This one, I'm going to be putting in three money purses. And in this one, I would be putting in three money purses and one ruby. And then, like I said, you're going to just put these uh, in order. It doesn't really matter what order they are in. But your train will look something like that. Again, it doesn't matter what order that they are placed in, except that you don't want the locomotive to be the front part of the train. The last car is going to be designated as the caboose, but you can see you'll just set your train up here. And like I said, this is set up for a four player game. Based on the number of players, that's going to determine which round cards you are going to use. If you have two to four players, you're gonna be using this uh, green stack of round cards. If you have five or six, you're gonna be using the orange. And either way, you're always going to be using one of the brown. These are the station cards. There's only three of those. However, you can see that there are quite a few of these. So let's say in a four-player game, basically what we're going to do is we're going to use this. We're going to shuffle these up. And then we are going to draw four of those. And the other ones are going to be returned to the box. Then we are going to shuffle these up. And we are going to add one of these to the bottom of the round stack. So basically this is the way it's going to look. Then at the start of the game we're going to basically flip this to this side and give this stack to the first player. Now when the uh, round advances to the next round then this goes to the next first player which would be to the left of whoever was the first player in the first round. 
There are 13 neutral bullet cards, and those are just going to be stacked next to the train. The Marshall and one of the $1,000 uh, briefcases is going to go into the locomotive. So in a four-player game, the first player and the third player are going to go into the caboose, and the second and the last player will go into the car next to the caboose. So when you've seated the train and put everything on there, it should look something like this. Now, depending on which round card you get, you may or may not use this second strong box. Uh, but you can return all of the other loot tokens and the jewel tokens to the box. You're not going to need those. And you can just place this next to the locomotive. At the beginning of every round, each player is going to take their 10 action cards and they're going to shuffle these up and then they are going to draw six of those into their hand. Now, how the cards are played into the common pile are going to be determined by how they appear on this round card. So, if it's a blank area here, you're going to be placing a card face up. So, the first player would place his first card face up and then so on with all the rest of the players. Then... Uh, when it gets everybody gets done with that, then you can see this one is going to be everybody is going to be playing a card face down to that common pile, then face up, face down, and face up. And then at the end of the round, there may be uh, a symbol here, and that will tell you what the action is on the card at the end of the round. In this case, there is actually no action, but you can see if we kind of peek ahead, there are other actions that we're going to be taking. As I mentioned earlier, each player has 10 action cards, and the only thing that is different is the art that shows essentially their character. But the actions are the same, and the distribution of the actions are the same. So we have one card that is going to allow us to move the marshal. So when that card is executed, basically you're going to take the marshal, and if he's in the locomotive here, you're just going to move him over one car. Now, the marshal is always going to stay inside the cars. He'll never actually go up on top. That's because the marshal's chief job is to protect the passengers and try to protect the loot. Each player also has one punch card. And what that is going to do is for any player that is in your car, you can punch them and make them essentially drop one of their uh, treasures. Now, it's going to drop into the car that you currently punched it, that person in, but then that character, let's say the red card, or the red character, Tuco, punched Doc, who is the blue. So what Doc would do is if he had a money bag on his uh, player board, then that would be added to that train car. And then the Doc Meeple basically would be knocked over to here. Now, let's say, for instance, that... Uh, Ghost actually hit Cheyenne. Cheyenne uh, could actually get bumped to this car or that car. The Ghost would determine which one. Whoever threw the punch is going to determine which direction that that player goes. However, if you're in the caboose, there's only one way to go, and that is uh, to this car. Likewise, if you are in the locomotive, the only way to go is to this car. Each player is going to have two shoot cards, and what this is going to do is you can shoot a character that is in a car that is adjacent to you if you are down here. Now, let's say Tuco played that shoot card. He could choose to either shoot Cheyenne or Ghost. And when he does that, he's going to take the top card from his uh, bullet deck, and he is going to give that to that player, and they're going to put that on top of their deck. These cards don't do anything except clog up another player's deck. And essentially, if they're drawing these uh, bullet cards, that means they're not drawing one of their action cards. So uh, it's always good to shoot the other players and get this to mess up their decks. Each player is going to have two of the rob cards. And what that means is that when that card is executed, you are going to be able to pick up one of the either the... Uh, uh, money purses or a jewel or even the strong box if the strong box is there you can look at it and then you can place it on your player card we have two cards that are basically going to allow us to either go up uh, on top of the uh, train car or back down inside of it so let's say tuco played that and tuco was down here in the caboose 
inside. Then you would just place him up on top of the car there. And then finally, each player has two of the run cards. And these work a little different depending on if you are on top of the train or if you are inside the train. If you are inside the train, you can only move to the next car or backwards if there is another car there. However, if you are on top of the train, you can move up to uh, three spaces, but you have to execute that. So I could go from the top of the caboose, one, two, three, up to that car if I wanted, or I could stop anywhere along the way. Also, when you are shooting another player, let's say that we have a situation like this. Cheyenne and Ghost are also on top. If Tuco shoots, then Tuco's only target is Cheyenne because she is blocking line of sight to Ghost. However, if they were both on top of the same car, then Tuco could pick which one he wanted to give the uh, bullet card to. Now, players do not want to be where the marshal is at. Now, let's say that Doc had played the move the marshal card on his turn, and when this gets resolved, basically Doc can choose which direction the marshal is going to move. He could either move back to the locomotive if he's here, but he probably doesn't want to do that. He probably wants to move him over here with Tuco. So if the marshal moves over here, that's where these neutral bullet cards are going to come in. Uh, this would be placed on top of Tuco's draw deck. And then, uh, because Tuco cannot be where the marshal is at, Tuco is going to have to go up to the roof. And that would be for any of the characters. I'm just using Tuco as the example. Also, players can never punch or shoot the marshal. Now I'm going to walk through actually playing the cards uh, to the common pile. So let's just say Tuco is the first player. So he's going to play that first card face up. And let's say he wants to do the shoot. So he's, he'll, he'll just place that there like that. And then let's say Doc is the next player. And Doc is going to do a rob. And then Cheyenne is going to throw a punch and Ghost is going to climb down. So that would be this first series. Now the next series, everybody is going to place cards face down. So let's say Tuco actually picks this, but he's going to place it face down. So nobody knows what action he just took. Same with Doc. And now we're back to uh, everybody playing a card face up. And then just for uh, time's sake, uh, the next round will be all cards face down. And then the last round will be face up. So I'm going to go ahead and place those there. And then we'll show you the resolution. The first player is going to take that stack. They're going to flip it upside down. And then they're going to start revealing cards one at a time and executing those actions. So we saw that Tuco was going to shoot. So he can shoot either Cheyenne or Ghost. And he will take the top card from his bullet stack and give it to one of those. So let's say he decides to give this to Ghost. This is going to go face down on top of Ghost draw deck. Next card we have is Doc is going to rob. So Doc can choose any one of these uh, loot items. And he can look at it. And you can see this one is worth $300. And he'll put that face down on his player board. Next, Cheyenne is going to throw a punch. So the only person that she can punch is Ghost. So uh, let's say Ghost only had one of the money purses on his uh, player board. Then uh, Ghost would be able to place that on top of the car there. And then Cheyenne gets to choose, does uh, Ghost go on that car or this car? And I think she's going to bump him over to where Tuco is at. Um, and because of Cheyenne's special ability, and I'll talk about all the player's special abilities, she can actually take the dropped loot item and put it on her player board immediately. The next card we have, Ghost, is actually going to go down. But because the Marshal is there, Ghost will actually get shot by the Marshal. So this is going to go on top of his draw deck. And then he is going to get bounced back up on top because he cannot stay where the Marshal is at. Next card we have is Tuco is going to run, and he can go up to three spaces, so he's going to run all the way over to the locomotive. Doc is going to run too, but because Doc is already in a car, 
he can only go one space. Cheyenne is also going to run and she is going to run three spaces because she wants to get to that lock box as well or that strong box. Ghost is actually going to shoot and he gets to choose either Tuco or Cheyenne who is going to get this and he decides to give this to Tuco. Next, Tuco's card is going to move the marshal. So he is going to move the marshal over here, which that means Doc is going to get one of the neutral bullet cards to go on top of his deck, and Doc will have to go up on top of the train car. Doc is going to attempt to rob, but because he is now up on top and there's no loot there, Doc actually doesn't get to do anything. Next card, Cheyenne is actually going to climb down. Ghost is going to run, and Ghost decides he's going to run to the locomotive. Whoops. Tuco decides he's going to climb down. Doc is going to move the marshal, and he'll move the marshal one space towards everyone else. Cheyenne is actually going to rob, and the only item that is in the locomotive is that $1,000 strong box, so she's going to put that on her player board. Ghost is going to run, and since the uh, strong box is not there, Doc decides that maybe he is going to go back over here. Or Ghost, I mean. Tuco is actually going to punch Cheyenne, which is going to make her drop one of her items, and he says, hey, drop that strong box. So that strong box is going to go back into the locomotive. Doc decides to shoot. The only person that he can shoot is Ghost. So he's going to give Ghost one of his bullet cards. Cheyenne is going to move the Marshal. And she's going to move the Marshal over to here. And then finally, uh, Ghost is going to move the Marshal as well. And he decides to move the Marshal back to there. Now, if there was an action item on the end of this round card, we would be performing that. Otherwise, this card is going to be discarded. This is given to the next player in turn order. Everyone will take all the cards that they played. Uh, they're going to shuffle up their draw deck, which includes any of the bullet cards they may have gotten either from the marshal or from another player. They are going to draw six uh, more cards, and then they will start another round. And they're going to keep doing that and moving uh, who is the first player. And then we're going to get to this station card. And you can see the station card is going to act just like all the rest of them. And like I said, there's only three of these. So this, all this, the uh, station cards all have an action that we're going to be doing at the end. But then what we're going to do is we're going to count up and see which of the bandits has the most loot. Whoever has the most loot is the winner. So I mentioned earlier that each of the players have a special ability. So let me show you those now. Tuco's special ability is that when he shoots, he can actually shoot through the roof of the car. If he is on top, then he can shoot to anybody that is below him. And if he is in the car, he can shoot anyone who is on top of the car. Belle cannot be punched or shot if someone takes that action where she is a target, unless she is the only target. If uh, an opponent has two targets to choose from, they cannot choose Bell. Doc's ability is that instead of drawing six cards at the start of the turn, he actually gets to draw seven. Cheyenne's I mentioned earlier that when she punches another bandit and causes them to drop a money purse, she can immediately pick that up and add it to her player board. She does not get to do that with strong boxes or jewels. Django's ability is when he shoots someone, he can actually knock them back one car. But you can never knock them completely off the train. So if he shoots somebody and that person is on the uh, or in the caboose, then they will just stay there. This is kind of like uh, the punch action where when you punch another bandit, then they get knocked over to the next car. Django's is when he shoots them, they get knocked over. And then finally, Ghost's ability is he can play the first card of every round face down. Now, you have the option, if you do not want to play a card or you don't have a card that really uh, fits what you want to play, instead of actually playing a card, you can draw three cards off of your draw deck. 
Uh, if Ghost does that on his first turn, he does not get to do this on his second turn. This is only if that occurs on his very first turn and he plays a card. So that's how you play Cold Express. So now let's get to what I think. I probably like this game more than I should. Um, this is a fairly light game, and it's one of the few programming games that I actually have in my collection. Um, in fact, it may be the only programming game that I actually have in my collection. Um, but let's start with the positives here. Um, I really love the theme. It's, it's a great theme. I love western theme games. Uh, I like the concept that we're all bandits trying to rob the train. Uh, I like the different actions that we have, the shooting, the punching, the robbing, you know, moving the marshal. Uh, I, I think those all work fairly well. Uh, I like the little meeples uh, that are our little gunslingers. You can see, you know, they're holding the, the guns out there. Uh, I like the art, even though the art is um, more on the cartoony side. Uh, for me, it actually works. I think there's, you know, some variability based on the player count that you have um, and the round cards. So you're gonna see that uh, you have different ones. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and you're only gonna use four of these. So you're gonna have a different game each time. And like I said, sometimes you have no action and sometimes you have other actions. Uh, so you can see out of this group, we only have two that are not, uh, that don't have any actions on them. But you know, they're pretty cool. Uh, I wish maybe they had more of the station cards with only three. Um, that part, the way the game is going to have that last round, um, can be a little samey. I think the table presence of the game with having the 3D train, I think is really kind of cool too. So now let's talk a little bit about the negatives. Uh, the game includes these little cardboard um, terrain pieces. They're not really doing anything for the game you're supposed to place them around the train and i guess it kind of gives it a little ambiance and maybe adds to the table presence um but these I, I don't even use them uh they're kind of a pain here's like this cactus um a lot of times they fall over and then you have some of these itty bitty little ones here and to me they're just not even worth it i don't even take them out of the box um that doesn't detract from the game by not using them at all uh, but it was just kind of one of those things like, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I just would not have bothered with that. The other part of the game that's kind of a negative is the fiddliness. Uh, trying to sometimes get your fingers inside of the train cars to either look at the loot or to move the uh, bandits along. Uh, a lot of times I'll knock, you know, one of the loot tokens out on the table and might flip over. Uh, Definitely, usually, if there is more than one bandit in a car, a lot of times I will knock that uh, other bandit out while I'm trying to grab uh, the one that I want to move. A lot of times I'll say, hey, everybody that I have taught this game to has loved it. This game has kind of been an exception. Uh, while people that I've taught recently, they didn't hate it. Um, I don't think they're clamoring for another play of it. Uh, they just thought it was okay. Um, and, you know, that's okay, too. This is kind of one of those games where I think you uh, have to play with the right people. Uh, it can get quite hilarious, especially when, uh, you know, you have these round cards where you're placing cards face down and nobody knows what action is happening there. So they may be expecting, you know, a, uh, a bandit to be in their location. And, you know, when they play that... Uh, play that next card they may be throwing a punch but that card that was played face down by this character you know might have moved him so this character may be swinging you know into thin air um that's kind of the fun element of the game with is when you have those things happen and those do happen frequently at least in the plays that i've had but overall i've really enjoyed this game uh, like I said, the, the negatives really are kind of minor. Um, I don't really mind that. And the game doesn't take that long. You're only playing five rounds. Um, I can kind of deal with the fiddliness. This doesn't hit the table as often as, say, some of my other Western theme games. Also, because you need a little higher player count than normal in order to really enjoy this. 
Uh, I've played this at uh, three, four, five, and six, and it's definitely best at five and six. Three is just okay uh, because, you know, in a three player game, you're only using three of the train cars and the locomotive. So you have a lot limited um, areas that you're going to go. And when you're playing with five or six, you know, you are going to be adding those other train cars, you know, to the end there. Um, so I definitely recommend playing this with the larger groups. Now, the accessibility on the game, I think anybody can really play it. Um, but some people, uh, especially somebody that I just recently taught it to, uh, had a little trouble kind of visualizing how they should be doing things. Um, and they, they had just a little bit of a, an issue grokking some of those. Um, but I think after they played it, they were ready to, they could play another game and uh, everything would be crystal clear to them. But like I said, overall, I enjoy the game. Uh, I've played this several times. And this is a game that you can play for free on Board Game Arena. Uh, in fact, I uh, had just been playing several games of this over the past week. Uh, on Board Game Arena to kind of refamiliarize myself because I hadn't played this in a while. Uh, but like I said, I did recently teach this uh, to three other people and uh, I think it went well. Like I said, they were not really wild about it, but they didn't hate it either. Uh, so this is a game where I liked it more than they did. I wouldn't call them, you know, hardcore gamers at all. In fact, I would call them entry-level gamers. Um, but it just kind of you know, wasn't necessarily their thing. And that's the way it is with every game, right? Some games, you know, people are really going to love. Some games people are just going to be kind of meh on. And some games people are actually going to hate. Um, this one is definitely going to be one that, you know, you're going to have to try for yourself and for your other gaming friends. But for me, I would recommend it if you like western theme games. I think the theme just comes out great here. Uh, I like the programming aspect of it. Uh, again, like I said, I like the, uh, you know, doing something that people don't expect when you're playing those cards face down. To me, that's all part of the fun. So that is Cult Express, and we will catch you guys next time. Thanks for watching our video. We hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, click that like and subscribe button. You can also follow us on social media like Facebook and Twitter at Dad Daughter. And if you like what we do and you want to support us, you can visit our Patreon page. So thanks for watching. Thanks. Oh,